Hey buddy, you sure? Not everyone saw Breath of the Wild as a masterpiece, but I think pretty much everyone agreed that it needed to happen. The Zelda series had stagnated and that reboot made it feel modern and exciting again. But the developers spent so much time on the new physics engine and open world that they understandably couldn't invest as much in the traditional Zelda elements, like dungeons and towns. The world had to be filled with repetitive shrines and busy work that wasn't always as interesting as the content in the more structured games. I didn't have any firm expectations going into the sequel, but I did hope that they'd give more attention to those neglected elements now that the basics were settled. That's not what Tears of the Kingdom does. If anything, it's closer to fixing Skyward Sword than Breath of the Wild. The world is once again multi-tiered with islands in the sky, but the starting area alone has more volume than all of the great sky combined. Travel to and from the sky is massively improved, and you can jump off an island anywhere, anytime. No stupid light shafts required. You can also ascend to new islands easily by rewinding falling debris or by launching from towers, which are much more useful this time. Instead of making a long climb to the top, towers now have more varied hurdles that never take too long to clear. Their extreme launch height allows more gliding time and a far better way to survey and travel the map. I thought that mixing Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild might produce the ideal Zelda game, and while this isn't at all what I was talking about, I'm glad the sky got a second chance in a form that actually works this time. The underground layer isn't nearly as interesting. It's very monotonous no matter where you go and doesn't have much vital content to experience. You can almost completely ignore it until the late stages of the game. That said, it's still enjoyable in its own dull sort of way. It's gratifying to forge paths of light and activate the light routes, especially when you can quickly spot the next route and chain a few together. The weird things that emerge from the darkness along the way help make up for how little else there is to see, and the floor is littered with valuable resources. 20 minutes underground is enough to stock up on bombs, arrows, and earn a battery upgrade or two. It gets tiresome to explore by the end of the game, but it's always there to offer a nice diversion when you lose interest in the main quest. It's the Hyrule in between that's the problem. When it was confirmed that the game would use the same map, I tried to keep an open mind. After all, my favorite Zelda was based on recycled content, and A Link Between Worlds proved that the same landscape can be refreshed with good results. This game does not pull off what those ones did. It feels like the same damn Breath of the Wild, with the same fields, stables, music, and endlessly repetitive shrines. You fight the same Boko camps and Yiga assassins, and collect the same outfits to go to the same places, talk to the same characters, and find the same damn fucking damn Koroks, sometimes in the same places they were before. After Breath of the Wild, I would have been fine never having to hunt a Korok again. The only evolution of the mechanic is the addition of pairs that need to be reunited, a task that almost always involves building some kind of machine to drive them across the map or haul them up a mountain. It's 20 times as much work as lifting a rock or shooting a target, and for only two seeds. It would need to be four or five to justify the hassle. There's another copy and paste quest involving a sign builder, which ran itself into the ground out of sheer triteness by his second appearance. The map is so stuffed with these that there's almost no direction you can look without spotting one, and I groaned every time I did because it meant the developers hadn't come up with anything more interesting for that area. Breath of the Wild was such a massive game that it took a lot of time and energy to explore it, but it was worth it for the sense of discovery. Not knowing what was over the next hill or what kind of challenges a new region would bring was what made it fun. This time it felt like I knew what was over every hill and had already done it, and the game rarely proved me wrong. Sometimes new circumstances do make a town interesting to revisit, and there can be random surprises out in the fields. Coaxing enemy factions into fighting each other while lying in wait to clean up the spoils is always entertaining. But mostly it feels like a new game plus, or some kind of ROM hack, or better yet, a master quest with iffy remixed content. Lurlin Village has an event involving pirates, which turns out to be clearing Bokoblins, pretty much like the hundred other Boko camps you've done. And the reward for it? Another fetch quest to collect a bunch of distant materials, which I noped right the fuck out of. Many of the fetch quests in the game chain right into another fetch quest, and I got in the habit of searching what their payoffs were before investing any time in them. They were almost never worth it. The developers talked about the addition of caves and wells making the world feel new, but what I found in wells was mostly rock salt or low-level equipment, and the caves all terminate in a crystal pickup that's useful for one specific shop, and if you're lucky, an article of clothing. This stuff in no way justifies spending 80 hours to scour the same map again. Instead of more, it can feel like there's less in some areas. The lack of guardians means that fields that were formerly dangerous to cross are now oddly empty. Sometimes you can join a traveling group of soldiers in a battle, but blowing all my weapons while the framerate chugs at 10 FPS isn't my idea of a good time. 
On my first Breath of the Wild playthrough, the Hero's Path almost covered the entire map, but here it's just a spindly line, despite giving both games about the same 80 hours of time. It takes far longer to cover all of the three layers, and there are so many other games I'd rather play than try to fill out the rest. I never made it to major chunks of the map, like the forest, a fact that the game itself started reminding me about every time I found a Korok near the end. It struck me as a sign of how demotivating the world was to explore, that the game had to resort to telling me, hey, can you please go here? I looked up what was there instead of going, because that was just the point I was at with the game, and found that I had already completed the quest that area was setting up. I finished the game without setting foot in the forest, and it didn't seem to matter. Things don't connect and work together as well as they should, and there's more chance for the non-linearity to cause hiccups like this. I didn't get the Shrine Tracker until the end of the game, since a few different underground quests have to be completed first. By the time I did receive it, I had explored enough to blow through every upgrade unlock. I also didn't find important abilities like Auto Build until later on, even though I was spending a lot of time in the chasms it's found in. Vital missions and upgrades are so spread out that it's hard not to overlook some of them until it's too late for them to be useful. The pacing and player guidance don't have the finesse that Breath of the Wild did. That game ensured that you got pretty much everything you needed on the Great Plateau, which was by a good margin the best opening of any Zelda. It felt fascinating to explore and primed you to feel like your arrival on the surface was a big moment. The Sky Ruins felt a little aimless and dragged in comparison, and the game gives you a runaround right upon landing, where you're told to go talk to a character, and then find a different character, and then go back to the first character again, and then repeat that sequence with many others. It's pedaling without going anywhere. That kind of padding gets repetitive fast, as do the story scenes that punctuate it. I wasn't a giant fan of Breath of the Wild's approach, but its environmental storytelling was more interesting than a whole lot of people shooting light out of their hands and telling the exact same story over and over and over. A tale of the imprisoning war. Okay. Let me tell you about the imprisoning war. Got it. It concerns the imprisoning war. I'm good. During the imprisoning I could tell you the story by now. The great fairies were unlocked with the rupees last time around. Simple. This time, you have to do item collection fetch quests for various characters, and then engage in some pretty awful transport and escort missions where the NPCs reset the whole thing if you so much as breathe too hard. Instead of replacing the busy work from Breath of the Wild with better content, it's as if they said, let's pack even more of that shit in and make it take a lot longer to do. After a six year development, and with a $70 price tag, it's extremely disappointing how much of this game is filler, and recycled filler at that. This was the worst case scenario I had imagined when hearing that the same world was being used again. When I realized I wasn't enjoying the game, I changed priorities and focused on the sky and underground, only dropping to the surface to hit towers and shrines. I enjoyed playing much more this way. It felt like a real sequel with new things to do, like piloting jet planes, or knocking a dragon out of the sky and taking the fight to the ground. But you can't escape the surface for long. To avoid one-hit kills, you will have to do those fairy quests and upgrade your gear. A process that, I discovered, really only works if the player is heavily exploring the map to gather items. For some upgrades, you'll have to shoot the same dragon eight different times, and it's more of a grind now that they no longer appear at set times of day. It's a mind-numbing bore, especially when the scales drop into a tar pit and disappear, or get swallowed up by a chasm. I settled for focusing on just a few outfits to save myself the time. You'll also have to grind for those Koroks for the new weapon system to work well. Every sword is rusted this time, leaving only brittle weapons for most of the game. This is made up for by the Fuse ability, which lets you pick up any random garbage to create a stronger weapon. As long as you have space, this improves the degradation system by making new weapons accessible pretty much all the time, and I never ran out of stock like I did in the previous game. The pickups gained from defeated enemies take on a more useful role by powering up weapons and adding new effects to arrows. There's a ridiculous number of combinations to experiment with, like putting a card on a shield to create a skateboard, or using a glider to fall more slowly. It's not likely that even resourceful players will uncover every possible combination in one playthrough, and the disposable weapon system makes more sense this way. But it's still too disposable. There are some cool secret weapons to obtain, but each time I immediately thought, yeah, I'm not using that. There's zero satisfaction to be had from something that will last 20 seconds before breaking, nor is there any from hoarding it the rest of the game. It's lose-lose no matter what you decide. I fused a light to my shield and got a moderately useful tool. That lasted 10 seconds before shattering. This was one of the best shields in the game, and not a single enemy had landed a scratch on it. It exploded from being held. I stocked up on water weapons for a boss weak to that element, and all of them were broken within half a minute. I love the fusing mechanic, but the fun is sucked out of it by how pointlessly frail some combinations are. 
By the end of the game, each weapon basically lasts for a single enemy. And this is with some of the best unrusted weapons fused with the best robot parts. And the Sword Sponge enemies are really bad when you only have garbage weapons on hand. Even with all the Sage allies joining in on the beatdown. Sage abilities work a lot differently than in Breath of the Wild. All of them are downgrades relative to that game, but that can be an interesting change. The Rito Sage gusts laterally instead of upwards, which helps you get more distance when gliding but isn't nearly as powerful as Rivali's Gale was for exploring the map. That puts more emphasis on diving in from the sky or using the Ascend ability to reach high places, which is one of the game's best ideas. Phasing through the ceiling of a cave to emerge on a mountaintop or skipping through the floors of a dungeon can radically change how you explore. In the same way that my Breath of the Wild muscle memory causes me to want to glide in other Zelda games, I think it'll be hard to return to old titles without wanting to jump through floors. I ascended right into the boss room of one temple early, and while the developers didn't allow the fight to begin, it still feels like some kind of cheat to have the power to get around like this. So in spite of the Wind Sage being nerfed, you have a net gain of options for reaching higher elevations. What is a problem with the Sage allies is that they will follow you at all times and all respond to the same button that you use for pretty much everything, making it impossible to avoid accidentally calling them. The system is so bad that I wasn't even frustrated by it. It became funny. When you need your ally for something, they're either too distant to reach, stuck on something, actively running away from you, or not even present at all. I frequently had to toggle them off and on in the menu to get them to show back up. But the moment a valuable item drops, they dive in front of it like they're taking a bullet for the fucking mare. You're fired! It is such a goddamn mess when all of the allies are active at once, blocking your view and getting in the way of one another so that you can't select the one you want without charging all of the others first. But I didn't turn them off because it was the best antidote for the weak weapons and spongy enemies. The gust especially helps with gliding too often to disable it. Toggling it only when needed would require constant pausing, like switching the iron boots on and off in Ocarina of Time. The arrow fusing interface is also surprisingly poor. There's just a single file row with every pickup you've ever collected in it. By the end of the game, it took me about 12 full seconds to scroll from end to end. Sorting by most used is the only way to make sense of the menu, but that doesn't work when an enemy requires an attack you haven't used before or when you want to experiment with something new. It also jumbles the items up when cooking, so I got in the habit of resorting the list each time I did one action or the other. There had to be a better way to do this. Maybe players could earmark the items they want to see first, or to appear in a second list of favorites alongside the general list. Being able to attach anything to an arrow is great, but it's annoying to have to manually pick the item for each and every shot. There should have been an option to set an arrow type like in the previous game, with the items fusing automatically until the player switches back. I also had problems getting the lock-on system to target the enemies I wanted. Tapping ZL is supposed to cycle through the targets, but it often kept selecting the one closest to the center of the screen, making it hard to address attacks coming from the sides. The camera also doesn't dither fade obstacles enough and easily gets obstructed by… every single thing. It's been a few years, so maybe this is how it was in Breath of the Wild, but I don't remember ever having this much of an issue with it. Apparently the game was finished last May, and the developers spent an entire year on polish so it's weird to see control systems as unpolished and clumsy as this. And I haven't even gotten to Ultra Hand yet. Yes, this is a great idea, and social media has been full of the insane contraptions players have managed to fuse out of random parts. That's become a game in and of itself. You can tailor make a device for whatever specific need a situation calls for, and it allows for even more flexibility in problem solving than Breath of the Wild. Players are challenged to think creatively in a way that's usually reserved for games like the Talos Principle. I get all of that, and it's a major achievement for the developers. <clears throat> but it is janky as fuck. She's out of control, hold on. Look out! Look out! Forget her! She's gone! Hold on! The wheels are off! It's gonna get worse before it gets better! Go, oh, go! The sequence trains you to attach wagon wheels directly to axles the first few times, then gives you wheels that absolutely can't work that way. Attaching them to a slab and then attaching the wagon to that was not how my brain was expecting this to work. It was ultimately my fault, but the developers aren't exactly meeting me halfway with these mixed messages. Parts stick where you don't want them to and take the whole device apart when detaching them. Pieces fall off with the slightest bumps. And the auto-build feature constantly aborts and drops the parts for no apparent reason. If an enemy intrudes on the building process, you lose your machine to the slightest graze of a weapon. Do you like the Elton John song Rocket Man? Because, uh, it's you. You're the Rocket Man. 
After failing with a few different ideas, I'd come back to the first one and it would suddenly work. So what changed between attempts? A part may have moved one inch. Sometimes I knew and sometimes I didn't, which made success feel arbitrary. A fan won't affix evenly unless you put it on one specific side of a balloon, leading to the thing spinning in circles after takeoff. Once fused, a strike on any part of a device will activate it, but Link often targets the wood itself and chops the whole thing apart. Or an enemy tosses a firebomb and torches the car you just assembled before you've driven it ten feet. Or you build a cool hovercraft and a sandstorm causes you, yes you, not me, to plow into a canyon and get stuck with a mission-critical object at the bottom. Trying to get the craft out in one piece with the parts I had on hand was a nightmare of trial and error, with either too little height or too little forward propulsion to escape, and the hot air balloon eventually just splattered away. May as well, I suppose. And it's worth mentioning that this was in the service of another collection quest that wouldn't have been much fun even if everything had gone smoothly. In cases like this, it's best to discard the vehicle and start over with a new one, since the parts have a strict usage limit before they dissolve anyway. The developers were smart to make parts very easy to obtain, but it seems like you do need to visit specific machines to get specific parts, which can make it easy to run out of the ones you need while overflowing with others. It wasn't clear how to get the gliders to work initially, so I tried creating sloped rails to launch one. No matter how steep, it would not slide on wood, even though they glide on metal with the slightest incline. So what surfaces work and which don't? What's the weight capacity of each fan or jet rocket? Why can rockets be placed upright on some objects, but not others? Because of the grating? It's kind of vague. How am I supposed to know that a cooking pot can be used as a suspension? If you're willing to screw around for hours just building for the sake of building, the tricks unfold themselves to you and practically anything becomes possible. But that's if. I often found that what I wanted to do didn't function within the rules of the game. Most of that was user error, sure, and I'm not arguing otherwise. But it is unclear what those rules are. By the end, the constant building got old for me and I just started cheating through puzzles to get them over with. I suppose even this could be an argument that the system works, since it allowed me to solve things my own half-assed, dumb-assed way. But it felt like every ten seconds of cool shit came with ten minutes of fighting to get a wheel to stick in the right place. The developers really seemed to want to expand on the emergent gameplay that made Breath of the Wild so popular. And they did. People really seemed to love this mechanic. But I think they bit off more than they could chew by creating too many options to possibly test and polish everything a player might try. A solution is always there, but you may have to wade through a bunch of busted shit to find it. This is a very subjective thing, and your engineering skills and enthusiasm for building could leave you with a completely different impression. I don't expect anyone to agree with me, but I also don't think it's a hot take to say that this could be a lot smoother than it is now. Some of the conventional puzzles were also pretty lame. The solution to one shrine is to run into a laser. Every fiber of your being as a gamer tells you not to touch lasers. There's a whole documentary about it. And the shrine reinforces that by harming you for doing so at the start. Then it tells you to touch lasers. These ones, not those ones. Even the more clever shrines felt like the things I had done 120 times in the last game. Sometimes I had it figured out while walking through the door. I had hoped for more dungeons and fewer shrines, because when the puzzles are spread thin like this, duds are bound to happen. Instead, shrines are even more numerous, while there are still four main temples, all in the same regions as before. For all the hype about dungeons returning, they still feel a lot like Divine Beasts. Each is a series of mostly unconnected trials taken on in any order. It makes sense for an open world to have open dungeons, and it is cool that they exist as part of the normal map. You can continue to scout landmarks from within them, or use them as skydiving sites. But they make me wonder if the classic dungeon feel depends on a linear series of challenges that build on one another. They're also very short. This temple has four switches to activate, but one is right at the start, so really there are just three. Temples being brief isn't a problem on its own, assuming there are enough of them. But with this few, each has more of a load to bear. They also need to be way less bland. Hi. I'm not trying to be this negative, and I appreciate that they are more diverse than last time, but they took more of a baby step than a leap, and I'm not even sure I'd say these are better than Divine Beasts. The Water Temple especially is a bunch of nothing, no different than any of the platforms you explored to get there. I could include the fifth Quasi-Temple in the list, but it would be the worst of them. If I ranked every 3D Zelda dungeon, none of these would even crack the middle. I realized while writing this that I didn't remember what the Fire Temple boss was. Part of that is that I'm 94 years young this summer, but it may also be that the fight was so easy that I barely took damage. Any Lionel is tougher. 
The Water Temple boss is a contender for the most annoying in the series, and you can add him to the list of filler content because he's reused underground, unaltered, multiple times. To say something positive, the lead-ups to some temples are much more fun this time. The dungeon music tends to be great, enough to be more memorable than the dungeons themselves. They also did a good job bringing Ganondorf back. The finale is more climactic than last time, and I wasn't left wanting more. I've seen people claim that everything they didn't like about Breath of the Wild was fixed, and I just don't see how. Travel has improved, but the padding actually got worse, and a lot of changes are half-steps to a solution without getting there. You can make elixirs to climb in the rain now, which was music to my ears, but they do both fuck all and nothing. It's like a snarky prank on the people who complained about rain last time. A single dose won't even get you over a modest wall, and a stronger potion takes a lot of grinding for lizards and frogs. There's a suit for the rain, but it's unlocked through a quest spanning the entire map. Hitting the towers and stables is one thing I actually did make sure to do, and I had earned one piece by the end. Mixing that with elixirs might get somewhere, but by then there isn't much climbing left to do. They addressed the complaints, but in the stingiest, least effective way possible, and rain still blocks some events from happening no matter what kind of potion you drink. Performance is even worse this time. Like, surprisingly bad. Breath of the Wild had slowdown in specific areas, but this game can run poorly wherever, especially when using Ultra Hand. There are battles based on that ability, and the slowdown is severe enough that they become choppy to play. The Zelda staff can't be faulted for this, but maybe Nintendo can for sticking with outdated hardware long past its developers had outgrown it. It's become common for Switch game reviews to devote a section to all the ways the ancient Tegra X1 held the game back, and this is another for the pile. On the bright side, the new audio system is a genuine improvement, and it was noticeable right away. Just listen to this. Buddy, get your ears ready for a treat. Very nice. When Breath of the Wild got moderate criticism, some fans didn't take it well. So I'm going to front load this conclusion with preemptive shitstorm buttressing. First, my reviews don't matter. My tingle ratings aren't going to show up on Metacritic. I am merely some guy, offering these for your entertainment, and there's no logical reason to be upset if you don't agree. I didn't have some very specific sequel in mind and then throw a fit because the game turned out differently. Again, I had a few hopes, nothing more. I'm not trying to get clicks, I didn't find the game too hard, or any of the other things people tend to say when they don't like a review. I understand why people are so defensive of Zelda. It's one of the oldest and most acclaimed series there is. Ocarina of Time is still the highest rated game on Metacritic. There's a high bar for every release, and people take it for granted that it will be cleared. I saw this being called Game of the Year before it was even out, but the reality is that most Zeldas don't live up to the hype. For every Ocarina of Time that changes the industry, there's a Wind Waker, where the development was cut short and padding was stuffed in its place. Or a Twilight Princess, a formulaic attempt to pander to fans with an epic world that the developers themselves admit they couldn't deliver on. Or a Skyward Sword, where the closed-up overworld fell flat, and directional swinging was overemphasized to the point of becoming a gimmick. Tears of the Kingdom belongs to that list of Zeldas, the ones where something went wrong. At its best, its stacked layers are an amazing evolution of 3D world design. It's the most mechanically rich Zelda, and sometimes it does feel like a better Breath of the Wild. I intermittently loved it, but the lows go low, and there are a lot of them. Those new mechanics can be a mess in this form, some of the control choices are baffling, and the building process has a lot of irritating quirks. I recognize what the developers accomplished with Ultra Hand, but this game feels like an even rougher draft than Breath of the Wild did. I understand all of the developers' arguments for it, but the recycled surface was an abject flop for me. The best case scenario is that you haven't played Breath of the Wild, and can enjoy the world with fresh eyes. Even if that is you, a lot of the content is insipid busywork. If the staff can't come up with more creative stuff to do, even when starting with a complete map and this much development time, they probably need to scale the games down. I'd much rather have a world half this size or smaller if it meant fewer fetch quests and enough dungeons for every region on the map. It's by no means a bad game, but it is a vast expanse of middling content saved by a few really inventive ideas. I'm not going to reduce something this complicated to a number, but on average I enjoyed it less than any other 3D Zelda. If there's a silver lining to end with, it's that there's so much room for improvement. Onuma said that Breath of the Wild would be the template for years to come, the way Ocarina of Time had been before. That game was a nearly perfect take on 3D Zelda, and the sequel struggled to get out of its shadow. There hasn't been a perfect open-world Zelda yet, not even close. 
So while I was let down by this game, I still like this new format, and I'm optimistic that Nintendo can and will top what they've done with it so far. Especially when they finally attain PS4 level hardware. In 2030. And if you don't like that, build a robot to kiss my ass. I'm serious. Upload clips of your ass kissing machines and I'll link to the best ones below. Preferably with full cheek coverage. Link, you must save Hyrule. Begin by bringing me 30 logs from the forests of Akala, 8 hot-footed frogs, and 6 blue bokoblin horns. Link, they must be blue bokoblin horns. Then, seek Sage Jock in the mountains of Nekluda. He will instruct you to come directly back to me. Then, we will construct a weapon to defeat Ganon once and for all. After you've collected 40 muddle buds, 8 Gleok wings, a silver Lionel Saber horn, and 90 Hylian pine cones. With the weapon assembled, you will infiltrate the castle, and then somewhere else because he's not there. And finally, deliver unto Ganon the decisive blow of 20 Henox teeth, 2 Molduga fins, 15 luminous stones, a warm Donna. A cold Dharma, a rugged rhino beetle, an electric Dharma, three razor claw crabs, ten chillfin trout, hateno cheese, a mighty thistle, two golden apples, and a partridge in a pear tree.